Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we all meet on and by paying our respects to their elders, past and present and emerging. 45% of Aboriginal Australians live with a disability or a long-term restricting health condition. They are 2.1 times more likely to live with a disability than non-Aboriginal Australians and five times more likely to experience a mental health condition. Yet Aboriginal people with disabilities participate in cultural activities at the same rate as those without disabilities. I pay my respects to their enduring spirit and fight. At this time, we also particularly remember the at least 432 Aboriginal people who have died in custody since the 1991 Royal Commission, some of whom had significant disabilities, with no convictions being made. We stand with the First Nations Disability Network and the Black Lives Matter movement in calling for justice. Thank you. So I would like to welcome to all, extend a welcome to all of our participants and thank you for allocating time to join us in this opportunity to hear from some COVID-19 pandemic specific reflections from leaders in disability inclusion about the work that they and their organisations have been doing throughout this period of unprecedented change to ensure that disability inclusion is not forgotten in the midst of many rapidly evolving responses to the crisis. So my name is Kylie Shea and I am the CEO of Motivation Australia and I'm currently the chair of the Australian Disability and Development Network or ADDC. The webinar that you are joining us for today is co-hosted by the Australian Council for International Development, so ACFID and ADDC. ACFID is the peak body for the Australian non-government organisations involved in international development and humanitarian action. And I know that many of you on the call today are organisation or members of organisations that are members of ACFID. Founded in 1965, ACFID has over 130 members working in 90 developing countries and supported by over one and a half million Australians. ACFID's purpose is to lead and unite members in action for a just, equitable and sustainable world. ACFID has a variety of learning offerings, including e-learning, Learn with ACFID, toolkits, webinars such as this one and workshops. And to learn more about those, please do visit the ACFID website. Introducing ADDC. Um, ADDC is an Australian-based international network focusing attention, expertise and action on disability issues in developing countries. We work through advocacy and provi by providing news, resources and networking to facilitate disability inclusive development in full recognition that at least 15% of the world's population live in disability, live with disability. These 15% are overrepresented amongst the world's poorest people and often excluded from accessing development and humanitarian programs. So obviously the issue of disability inclusion is very, um, very much central to the work of ADDC. And again, I really thank you all for your attention to this issue. Membership and subscription to ADDC is free. And you can register in the exit survey if you are not already a member at the end of this webinar or via the ADDC website. Some of you may also have already participated in the Disability Focal Point Network, which is a monthly online discussion and networking meeting with international development practitioners to discuss topics around practicing and promoting disability inclusive development within your work. So if you're interested in joining that, please let us know via the exit survey or you can contact um, Lucy Daniel at, uh, so actually I think you've got, yes, you have her email address up on the screen. So ldaniel at addc.org.au. Lucy is our executive officer and would love to hear from you. So without further review, um, ah, before I introduce our speakers, I will just let you know what our plan for this afternoon is. So you will be hearing from three speakers who I'll introduce shortly. And then after the, each person has spoken, you will, we will have a panel discussion with some uh, questions and discussion between the speakers. 
And we're also going to then take the opportunity of the webinar to support the launch of a very timely guidance report on making research inclusive of people with disabilities. We'll then open up the session at the end for a brief Q&A. And at this point, I'd like you to start thinking about questions that you may have or may arise during the session um, for the Q&A session. You can enter your questions into the Q&A area, which I hope you can see on your webinar. Down the bottom to the right, you should see a Q&A button. Um, and to think about using the opportunity to use the insights and experience of our speakers to help you answer questions you may have about how you can best apply in practical ways the principles of disability inclusion into your work. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Mr. Setaraki Makanawe, who is currently the CEO of the Pacific Disability Forum. Seta holds a Bachelor of Education and Masters with Honours in Educational Administration from the University of New England in Australia. Seta has received several regional and international awards in recognition of his professional and academic achievements in the field of disability. He is a leading disability advocate and he has served in the committees of many international and regional organisations and written journal articles on disability. He's a keen advocate of disability inclusive development where persons with disabilities and their representative organisations are in the front and centre and playing a key role in all aspects of development. Seta, over to you. Uh, and. Um... A uh, warm uh, Pacific greetings to um, all those uh, of you that have uh, tuned into this webinar. And may I also take the opportunity on behalf of the Pacific Disability Forum to thank uh, ADDC and ECFID, as well as uh, fellow uh, colleagues here on the panel uh, for this session. Uh, I will be sharing the, the experience from the Pacific uh, in relation to this pandemic that has got all of us are by surprise. The work that we did uh, with Pacific Disability Forum in terms of our response largely around uh, th three areas. Um, firstly is the strength, strengthening the capacity of our uh, disabled people's organizations. Uh, as I said, this was unplanned. Uh, it came as a big surprise. So our team in, in the Secretariat uh, through our body program that we have with, uh, with, uh, with our member DPOs, each work with about three DPOs, each staff. Uh, firstly, to find out, uh, assess the capacity, how are they um, handling, responding to, to, to the, even the thoughts, the, the, the news about COVID-19. Uh, and secondly, uh, the capacity to be able to engage with, uh, with, with, uh, with their partners uh, in, in, on the ground. We also then facilitate also the, the, the sharing of uh, lived experiences of personal disability during COVID. You know uh, that uh, here in the Pacific, it is Fiji, Papua New Guinea, uh, Guava, of course, up in the north, and CNMI, uh, Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, uh, as well as uh, uh, the French Pacific uh, territories. Tahiti and Nikel Dani were had uh, uh, active uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, cases. Uh, the others were luck luckily did not have. So for us, um, it, it, is, it is focusing on, on this three, as I said earlier, with our DPOs. Um, and uh, with that also include uh, working with our DPOs on, on their messaging. Um, the key messages that are that they can frame, the messages that are coming in from their partners, the, the governments, uh, on how those messages can be disability inclusive. Second area we worked on was uh, our participation representation in the various cluster meetings, if you like, with our partners, uh, ensure, ensuring that uh, the voice of person disabilities, both at the regional and global levels where we had participated, are shared. Uh, and, and then, of course, a key area there is the highlighting of the gaps in disability inclusive messaging. Uh, a, clean, a clean example is around social distance, distancing. How does that uh, fare with person disabilities? Um, and also, particularly with uh, the UN uh, key agencies like WHO, uh, 
uh, to, to be able to, in, to, to influence the advisory that they're giving to countries in the region. We also develop, along with our partners, the CVM Australia in particular, um, issue papers. And we targeted education, uh, WASH, uh, food security, health, uh, information, and social protection. How does this look like to persons with disabilities in a COVID-19 pandemic uh, setting? Um, we, we are also conducting a live blog in a, as part of our social media, sharing the experiences of persons with disabilities uh, in relation to COVID-19. The third area of our work, um, first on the DPOs, secondly, on our participation um, in, in the work on inclusion, and thirdly, the provision of technical assistance and advice to our partners. And here we develop some key uh, so core disability inclusion uh, COVID-19 uh, documents. And thanks to uh, the Secretary of the Civic Community, they helped us in the translation of these uh, documents into French. So that can be shared with our French uh, DPO members in the three French Pacific uh, territories. Um, they, are, they are on our, our website and these documents can be shared if you are interested to, to find out what these documents are. Uh, just give you just a couple of uh, guideline on preconditions. Um, interestingly, because um, TC Herald did come in the, the midst of uh, COVID-19, so we also put out a paper, a guideline on disability inclusion considerations to a disaster in, 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 in the um, light of uh, the pandemic, COVID-19. A uh, human rights-based approach, as I said. Um, I'll, I'll turn to the challenges and opportunities that uh, we faced. Uh, the challenge, of course, the big one, it came as unexpected, so we had not allocated resources, both um, human and financial, uh, when COVID-19 came. So thankfully, uh, and for the, uh, the, 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 the reality of having a flexibility within our funding arrangement, not just at uh, PDF level, I know for Disability Rights Fund, I uh, did a lot of flexibility to their grantees in the Pacific to divert um, some of the funding to COVID-19 work. Uh, I pressed for time uh, to deliver um, and the uncertainty around the uncertainty of COVID-19. Um, another challenge is um, a new type of emergency. Uh, we are used to uh, dealing with uh, disaster risk reduction management, climate change, this one is new and it's changing. Uh, the other challenge if I, if I, uh, we faced was uh, cracking some of the hard nuts uh, to crack um, when their regulations, their systems do not allow us to uh, influence, uh, such as data, the lack of data, um, and also with, 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 uh, with the information that are coming through. Uh, the lack of accessibility is another issue, both guidelines uh, that ought to be followed um, uh, during the COVID-19. And we got some countries do not have those in place. So it's hard to, to, to have that in place. And of course, one of the challenges also is a lack of support to the organizations of persons with disabilities to be able to do their work and of advocacy uh, to their partners in country. Um, opportunities. We, we, we saw that uh, the COVID-19 is, is an opportunity for us to do further research and identify gaps, uh, funding and around disability inclusion. Uh, it was rushed, it was um, hurried processes, people want to be all involved, and sometimes persons with disabilities are left behind uh, and are marginalized, further marginalized. Uh, also an opportunity for us to work with our DPOs in setting up the resource team uh, to be multitask, to be able to also sharpen the advocacy uh, messages and the opportunity to access funding that we would not have otherwise uh, received, for example, with WHO, on uh, production of materials uh, and standardized training packages for our DPOs. Uh, Lessons learned, uh, the last bit of my uh, sharing this, uh, this, this, this afternoon for this particular session. 
Um, what's the some of the lessons that we've learned? We need to be creative in our response. Uh, not just a disability inclusive response, a creative, innovative disability response. Uh, when things do things like this happen, uh, we are working rapidly with climate change, the disaster risk reduction. Now, health issues arise. Are we ready to to uh, to to um, uh, prepare for that? Uh, should another uh, pandemic come? Uh, and also the strengthening of our advocacy uh, to enable the change in the systems uh, happened and happened fast. Um, human rights based approach, I think that's critical. We need to be uh, one of the lessons learned, we need to do that uh, better and ensure that is there from the get go. Um, because, and luckily, and I'll close in this point. Uh, Though the, the, the lot of the COVID response is focusing on prevention, um, fortunately, not many, just a couple of countries that were affected by COVID-19, the others are not. So I think how we can then use that to, to prepare ourselves uh, now and, and, and not be caught by surprise again. And I think the last point for, for me on this um, lessons learned the economic hardships faced by persons with disabilities. And I'll talk about this uh, in a later segment. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you very much, Seda. Much appreciated. And yes, each of the speakers are going to be looking at those sections that um, Seta was outlining around, you know, what have you been doing as an organisation? Where are the challenges and where are the opportunities that COVID-19 have presented? Um, so, coming now, I'd like to introduce you to Samantha French, who is our second speaker. Um, Sam is a Senior Policy Officer for People with Disability Australia. She's been an active member in the disability field for over 25 years, working in the government and non-government organisation sectors on disability policy, education, consultancy and more. As a person with a disability, Samantha is an active member of a number of disabled persons organisation representative networks across Australia and the Pacific region, including Women with Disability Australia, and as a board member of the Pacific Disability Forum. Sam was directly involved in the development of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities as a civil society representative. And I know that since COVID arrived, she has been extremely busy. So looking forward to hearing a bit more about what PWDA have been doing and then also Sam's involvement in those regional networks during this time. Over to you, Sam. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. And I also wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to speak with everyone today. I'm going to be talking from the perspective of a disabled persons organisation. So my organisation, People with Disability Australia, is a national disability advocacy organisation. And we work um, in providing a voice for people with disability where uh, our members are people with disability. So we're a representative organisation. And I've, many of you would be aware of the role that um, DPOs play in international development efforts. So. Um, just wanted to share with you what we've been doing um, as a DPO and our involvement a little bit at the domestic level, but also how we've networked and engaged with other DPOs um, to strengthen our advocacy in this, this area. So um, we, as a DPO and an advocacy organisation, we, um, we do provide individual advocacy, we provide systemic advocacy, policy work. We also do outreach work to hard to reach communities. And, um, and training and all sorts of other things. But we're also, as a disabled persons organisation, we're very much involved with our other networks. So um, the Pacific Disability Forum, for example, and other networks such as the International Disability Alliance. And they've been very important partners to have, not only in supporting the work that we do, um, but also particularly during a situation like COVID. In terms of what we've picked up, um, what our organisation has been involved in, the key issues that we've found for people with disability during COVID, uh, we're finding a similar in Australia as they are globally. So the, obviously the immediate threat to us safety and life 
through the COVID and we also had, um, as you'd be aware, the bushfires, worst bushfires in history. Um, but also those people who are living in segregated or closed settings, such as group homes, or maybe be reliant on family and have been um, self-isolating, um, but also can include people whose uh, services have been overly stringent around the restrictions and have literally locked people into situations. Those that are also most marginalised, so such as people who are homeless and those with psychosocial disability. And physical distancing has actually brought about some um, very key challenges for certain groups. So um, for some people, physical distancing has meant isolation um, from their services, essential services and supports, and also their heightened risk for people with disability in those situations for exposure to violence, abuse and neglect. Um, we have seen an increase in suicide. We've seen an increase, increase in domestic violence. So these are all things that have significantly increased. And we think to um, some degree, the physical distancing or social distancing, we like to use the term physical distancing, has been a part of that. Restrictive practices being used. And as I mentioned, um, lack of continuity of supports. So they're the key areas that we've been advocating on. And try, really trying to reach out. Um, we've found that... The, it's the importance of not only advocacy, but also outreach to those people who cannot, for whatever, for various reasons, come to us or even call us. So the importance of outreach. And in that, you'll hear me often talk about the necessity for advocacy to be classed or considered, acknowledged as an essential service. And this does not only, as I mentioned before, this is what we're hearing globally. So in terms of our national disability work during COVID, uh, we've been, um, initially there was, and traditionally in Australia, there is very little engagement with DPOs and advocacy um, organisations on emergency response. We've been quite active, um, PWD, my organisation has been quite active at the regional and international level. We've done um, quite a lot of work with the PDF and other um, UN bodies around development of regional strategies for um, implementing the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, but also on disaster risk reduction and response. So, but at the domestic level, that has been very weak. So for us, we were brought into the pitch quite late compared to other, other uh, stakeholders or responders. We, um, that was challenging in that we had, we had to advocate very strongly to be, have a seat at the table. Now we have been um, brought into most decision-making um, roles and we've now um, we've helped to develop a national COVID-19 response plan. We've even been involved with uh, development of ethical triaging protocols in times of pandemics. So the areas of work which we traditionally have definitely not had any involvement in. So it's been, um, and I don't want to, We've also written an open letter to the National Cabinet. We've done a lot of work um, with sister DPOs around uh, group advocating in terms of what um, our key concerns and what we think are solutions, so trying to be solutions focused. And we have, have now got a seat at the table. We are involved with a lot of high level decision making. Um, but we are now at the point where we're rolling out those national plans at local level. And again, the challenges come, SETA has um, I mentioned a number of these, that challenges come where advocacy, DPOs are not resourced to do this work. We're doing this work on top of other um, critical advocacy work. Um, so there has been traditionally lack of engagement. That is changing. That is now an opportunity that um, we need to learn from. We also have a lot of different jurisdictions and sectors implementing response. Um, and that, that it has caused some fragmentation, confusion, and um, inconsistency also in messaging. Opportunities, um, look, now that we have become involved, and again, I can't, I can't um, emphasize this enough, that this is what we're hearing globally when we connect with our global DPO networks. These are very similar um, stories that not only the, the the problems that we're seeing, the, the concerns, but also the opportunities that once DPOs are brought into the planning and the response to emergencies. We're, we're, we're demonstrating that we are best placed to advise on accessible guidelines and practices, to provide independent advocacy and advice, to uh, provide outreach into closed settings and where people are most excluded. 
that advocacy has filled a gap uh, to ensure that there's integrated approach to support coordination and um, and and that we're being out in a position where we can monitor how the response to COVID and other disasters are occurring. Um, so I think I've come to the end of my time. Um, so just to sum up in terms of lessons we've learnt, the importance of greater engagement, and this applies to uh, it, to any environment that um, where you can to support that engagement between disabled people's organisations, advocates, and um, other agencies involved in the planning and response efforts, that we need great improved coordination and that we need to recognise and resource DPOs and advocates as essential services to provide necessary information advocacy. And I think I might leave it, I think I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. And I think what really came through in that, and certainly when we were talking a couple of days ago about this, is that importance of having the DPO networks there and established and the incredible role that you play in this and also that linking of this, the work you've been doing in Australia and the work that you're doing engaged with DPOs in our region and, and how you've all been learning and sharing from each other and we might try and pull that out a little bit more in the panel discussion. Definitely, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and now I have the great pleasure to introduce Nika Kontanyan, who is the Director of the Disability Inclusion Section of the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, so DFAT. Um, Nika is responsible for managing policy advice on disability inclusion and disability rights in Australia's international advocacy, dip, uh, diplomatic efforts and aid program investments and for supporting the implementation of DFAT's Disability Strategy Development for All 215 to 220. Previously in 2011 to 2014, Nika held a similar role managing the Australian Aid Policy for Communicable and Non-Communicable Disease as the Director of Disease Prevention and Control. Nika has also held a range of challenging and high profile leadership roles in the Attorney General's Department, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and the Department of Immigration and Citizenship. Nika holds a Master of Arts in International Relations. And I shall now hand her over to you to finish off our third speaker, and, uh, and then we'll move on to the panel discussion. Thank you, Nika. Thank you, Kylie, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on this uh, wonderful day, working from home, dealing with COVID-19 work restrictions, um, which of course means that I'm not required to wear my normal suit. Uh, as Seta was saying, uh, when COVID-19 came along, it was completely unexpected. Uh, three months ago, the government was well and truly on track to release a new development policy by about April of this year and a new disability policy by the end of this year. Then COVID-19 came along and we had to divert all our resources to supporting a COVID-19 response, which became the number one priority for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So in that very rapid pivot towards COVID-19, we've had to start down tools on what we thought we'd be working on and start focusing more on COVID-19 itself. Um, just recently, the Foreign Minister has launched a new development policy called Partnerships for Recovery, Australia's COVID-19 development response. And as noted in the ministerial forward for that policy, Australia's response to COVID-19 will include a focus on the most vulnerable, including women and girls and people with disabilities and those living in poverty. What the new Partnerships for Recovery uh, uh, policy recognises is that pandemics will exacerbate the inequalities and hardships faced by already vulnerable groups, including people with disabilities, who already face multiple levels of exclusion and who will be particularly vulnerable as health and other social services are disrupted. Now, um, our approach to disability inclusion has been long-standing. It's been clearly articulated in the foreign policy white paper, which commits Australia to disability inclusion alongside gender equality as a cross-cutting priority for our international engagement in development, 
humanitarian action and in human rights. Our global leadership in disability inclusion, together with DFAT's capacity to deliver disability inclusive and development, disability inclusive development and humanitarian programs is built on a series of long-standing mutually reinforcing strategic partnerships with international civil society and multilateral organisations. Some of the most important of those partnerships are with CBM Australia, with the International Disability Alliance, with the Disability Rights Advocacy Fund, the UN Partnership on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and of course, the Pacific Disability Forum. And I'm delighted to be speaking alongside PDF CEO Setter this afternoon. These partnerships are the primary enablers by which DFAT's international engagement on disability is progressed because they do three things for us. Firstly, they provide us with the access to the essential technical assistance and advice, including advice from the perspective of people with a lived experience of disability. These partnerships also support disabled people's organisations to contribute to and benefit from development, humanitarian action and human rights processes. And thirdly, these partnerships are essential for influencing uh, other stakeholders, particularly the UN system, to be more disability inclusive. If you have a look at how it works in the Pacific, for example, you can see how these, uh, these relate to each other, how they mutually reinforce. In the Pacific, our principal partner is the Pacific Disability Forum. We have a direct funding relationship with them, provide them with funding. We also provide funding to the International Disability Alliance, of which PDF is a member. And PDF provides that voice of advocacy for people with disabilities, including from the Pacific, within the UN system. We also provide funding to the Disability Rights Advocacy Fund, which then provides grants to DPOs in developing countries, including in the Pacific, and including to PDF member organisations. Um, our funding to the UNPRPD enables the UN country teams in the Pacific to engage in joint programming that is disability inclusive and is done in partnership with local DPOs. So we have this very effective network of relationships with key stakeholders, all of which are designed to deliver a rights-based approach to disability inclusion, something that gives people with disabilities an active and meaningful role, both as participants and as beneficiaries in the development programs that we are delivering. Now, in the face of COVID-19, all these partnerships are pivoting towards supporting a disability inclusive COVID-19 response and recovery. Um, PDF has been doing a sterling job of this at the, um, at the regional and country level in the Pacific, but you can also see it happening more, uh, also see it happening at the uh, global level in the UN, for example, where uh, Australia's support and the voice of people with disabilities from including the Pacific has um, seen the UN system starting to uh, pivot towards a disability inclusive COVID-19 response and recovery. Uh, most recently, if you're interested, the Secretary General launched a policy brief on disability inclusive COVID-19 response, which was made possible in part because of the quiet advocacy behind the scenes by the Australian government and by Australian funded uh, DPOs like the International Disability Alliance. At the programmatic level, um, the various parts of the Australian development and humanitarian program are also uh, pivoting towards supporting disability inclusive COVID-19 response. Um, one example of that is around social protection. What the pandemic has demonstrated is that investing in inclusive, accessible and disaster responsive social protection systems is crucial. So DFAT has been providing technical assistance to our bilateral partners to ensure that the scale up of social protection programs are inclusive. Um, this includes health services and other services like nutrition and food voucher programs. Um, elsewhere, um, if you take the example of WASH, for example, um, the Water for Women program 
has been working in a number of countries on supporting disability inclusive COVID-19 responses. In Vanuatu, uh, World Vision is installing accessible hand washing stations with safe drinking water facilities in key public places. In uh, India, the Centre for Advocacy and Research is distributing COVID-19 hygiene messages in Braille. Um, and in Indonesia, our plan is working with people with disabilities to sustain their livelihoods by redirecting their massage businesses towards making masks as per the Government of Indonesia requirements. Um, elsewhere, we're seeing um, DFAT funded partners like WaterAid supporting local rights groups in the Pacific to identify joint advocacy opportunities, as well as um, examples such as CBM supporting a project in the Sudan in Africa, which is working with local DPOs and community-based inclusive development workers, CBID workers, to translate public health messages, to distribute COVID-19 materials, and to facilitate the broadcast of radio talk shows. Um, what uh, these show often is that a key element is supporting um, people with disabilities and DPOs by focusing on accessible information. So a common feature of what's happening at the programmatic level is supporting sign language interpretation um, on the crisis response to COVID-19, um, as well as um, disseminating information in other forms. So quite often we're seeing that uh, uh, Australian funding is being used to support sign language interpretation uh, to help deliver those, uh, those messages. Uh, and so as, so as to allow some time for question and answer, I think I'll just pause there for the moment. How and back over to you, Kylie, and um, happy to take further questions as we go along. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mika. And um, it is interesting that there is such a broad range of programmatic um, level inputs that are funded by DFAT across a real spread. So, you know, it's not just in one sector, it's it's across quite a wide range. So I think that that's very interesting for a lot of people to see that breadth. Um, I, I can see that there's a couple of questions that have come in on the Q&A chat, and I'll try and work some of those into the, um, one of those I can see. Oh, there's some more coming now. Please do start um, putting questions into the Q&A chat so that we can start building some of those into the panel discussion now. Um, and then in the meantime, I'm just wondering if Seta and um, Sam, you'd like to turn your videos back on so that we can have you back up onto the panel. And I might start with you, Mika, with a question. Um, we've just talked about the fact that, yes, the DFAT investments have been across a broad range of sectors, um, but we do know that with COVID-19, one of the things that a lot of people were initially were immediately starting to talk about from a developing country context is the weakness of health systems and the fact that health systems need to be strong and well prepared to be able to cope with something like this. And yes, it was unexpected, but we do know that health systems are going to suffer shocks from, from time to time and we need to have strong systems in place to be ready for those. So with this in mind, is this an opportunity as we go forward with the Australian aid program to ensure that a renewed focus on strengthening our, the overall health systems in countries is disability inclusive from the ground up that we're really thinking about that in, in any new program approaches? Thanks, Kylie. Um, as a student of history, um, I remember John F. Kennedy, uh, not because I was around then, but I've studied him, uh, and in his campaign speeches back in 1959 and 1960, he used to often refer to the Chinese word for crisis as being composed of two characters, um, one representing danger, the other opportunity. Linguistically, this widespread uh, public misconception is actually not entirely accurate. Um, but in the case of COVID-19, there is indeed opportunity to promote and support disability inclusive health system strengthening based on the concept of universal health coverage. So universal health coverage is the idea that all people and communities 
have access to the health services they need without suffering financial hardship. Unfortunately, about half the world's population does not have access to essential health services. Now, Australia is a signatory to the global commitment to achieve universal health coverage through the Sustainable Development Goals. Known as the UHC 2030, this global compact has been agreed to by all 193 member states of the United Nations. The concept of leave no one behind is core to universal health coverage, meaning that people with disabilities will benefit from this work. Now, COVID-19 presents an opportunity for further investment in disability inclusive health services and progress towards universal health coverage. For a start, the pandemic has highlighted the importance of access to inclusive and non-discriminatory health services for people with disabilities. In addition, it's highlighted the need for comprehensive and inclusive social protection mechanisms to support access to universal health coverage. It's highlighted the value of support services for people with disabilities to enable access to those health services. And it's also highlighted the importance of shifting attitudes and equipping frontline health personnel and health manage management to ensure that people with disabilities are not deprioritized. Now, in response to COVID-19, um, I'm seeing a renewed interest and commitment from across DFAT's health and health security programs in relation to disability inclusion. For example, I've seen that the Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security is now actively looking for opportunities to enhance disability inclusion within both existing and new grant partners that are pivoting their programs to respond to COVID-19, including through workforce development, inclusive training, disaggregation of surveillance data, more accessible health information, and deeper epidemiological analysis. Um, all of these opportunities are built on the recognition that it is essential to actually partner with people with disabilities and their representative organisations. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think that's, that there's, again, there's an awful lot happening and there's an awful lot of opportunity. And I think what I'd like to do now is, um, is actually shift the focus from health, having put the spotlight on there. And, um, and Seta, I wanted to just explore a little bit um, in, yes, the health response to COVID in the Pacific in, in initially focused on prevention and preparation. But we have, as you said, we've been fortunate that there's been really low incidences of COVID in the region. Um, however, Pacific Island people are actually being greatly impacted as a whole by the economic impacts of the COVID prevention responses themselves because of the travel restrictions internally and closing of international borders, shutting down of economies. So is PDF and your networks, are you seeing that economic hardship creating additional challenges for people with disabilities? What are the opportunities as national governments and development partners respond to the economic impacts to ensure that these responses are disability inclusive. inclusive. And I, I pose that question in the knowledge that the focus of the Australian government aid program will be looking at health security, but also economic recovery amongst another, a, a few other areas, but economic recovery so we can exceed, we are likely to see programs that are targeting economic recovery, how do we make sure that that is truly disability inclusive? Seta. Yeah, so thank you, Kylie. Yeah, that, uh, it's a great uh, question indeed. Uh, and, and yes, certainly uh, to those countries um, uh, due to close of borders, see in the Pacific and countries that have had um, uh, uh, COVID-19 cases like, like Fiji, Papua New Guinea, and, and others up north that I mentioned earlier, the the the, the effect of the effect on the economic uh, like uh, the economic challenges that that people, um, for example, in Fiji, uh, experience because of uh, no travel, uh, well, uh, borders closing, uh, tourism almost collapsing, uh, so hotels uh, workers are being sent home. 
uh, some of the other industry. Uh, so the, 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 the effect of COVID-19 on the economic well-being of families, uh, if you like, where they've been affected, include where they include persons with disabilities, they are part of, they, they do feel the pinch as well. The, the, um, our, our DPOs in uh, some of our countries, uh, here in Fiji and, and, and others have um, also experienced, um, uh, there's a DPOs in Fiji uh, uh, slashed in their funding um, from, from the government. Um, they've received the first and the second quarter, but not the third and the fourth quarter. Uh, which means that their, their, their staff, or some of whom are persons with disabilities, uh, have to work on reduced hours or sent home. Um, and now we, increase, we continue to hear uh, companies, even smaller companies, closing down. So the, the effect on people, uh, not just economically, but even in terms of their mental health, their well-being, uh, to know that um, there is the uncertainty around uh, around cash flow, their funding, uh, the, the food on the table. Um, though, though, though schools are closed, still closed at the moment in most of the countries in, in the Pacific, uh, they, they, that when the close real school resumes, they will also feel the pinch there in terms of need to provide for their children. So all in all, uh, um, there, there's certainly been, uh, personal disabilities have not been spared. Uh, by the, the effect of COVID pandemic, uh, pandemic on, on the economy of our countries. Uh, Tonga is the only country that we know of. The governments have been able to top up their, their social protection. I think around $85 US, if I'm correct, uh, were, were added to their uh, social protection. Uh, Fiji, on the other hand, the, so the bus fare scheme for persons with disabilities is to be $40 a month, reduced to $20. And those persons with disabilities who, are, who had applied for social protection during the COVID pandemic uh, period, uh, the, those applications have been put on hold. Luckily, and, and the, the thankful, the, thank, I did mention this earlier around what government and partners can do. Uh, government in Tonga has done, I think, has done the right thing. Uh, I think Fiji sh should not have done what they did. Uh, they, they. Um, instead of slashing funds um, and adding to, to the burden, uh, they should have retained those, um, those, those social uh, protection schemes and even added to it like, like what Tonga did. Uh, interestingly, the, the Fiji National Provident Fund, I think the, some of the social security system for Fiji, for those that are working, are helping those who are contributing to that scheme. Persons with disabilities who don't have a job will, uh, will miss out because they don't have any contribution. What do they get? Nothing. So I think the, 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 the countries, our country, our governments in the Pacific can do better uh, in, in ensuring that the, the, the person's disabilities are not being made worse off uh, as a result of this uh, pandemic. Um, I mentioned earlier about uh, Disability Rights Advocacy Fund talking to uh, the, the members here in the Pacific and thanks also to DFAT for the funding. Uh, they were able to uh, revire, if you like, the, the, the funding on the, on the, on the work to, to address COVID and, and the staffing. Uh, we've had similar conversations with uh, Mika and his team around how the support that we can uh, give to, to, to our members uh, from uh, the funding that we currently have. So I think, and I mentioned this also uh, earlier, the flexibility around a core funding arrangement, a provision within that when crisis happens, when tough time comes. The, the flexibility within a funding mechanism to allow uh, for, uh, for uh, um, revirement, if you like, of, of funding to areas that's needed the most. So all in all, I think, uh, Kylie, uh, we certainly are feeling it. Uh, um, uh, and, and Sam also mentioned this earlier around services to persons who are marginalized. We do not have those services to uh, for people with who are intellectually Intellectual disability or psychosocial disability, uh, they do miss out because there's no organized services, support services for them. So it, it covers the, the, the pandemic is affecting us economically, uh, financially, economically, uh, and in terms of the health I mentioned earlier, uh, stress and the like. And of course, not knowing what 
is coming next. The uncertainty, another uncertainty that COVID is bringing to, 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 our, to our region is, uh, is huge. Thank you, Kylie. Okay. Thank you very much, Sedar. And, and I think that is a really good point you, you've raised that, yes, there's economic impacts, but there's also that uncertainty, which has all of those mental health um, components to that, which increases people's stress. And certainly when you're not sure where the next piece of funding is going to come from. Um, Sam, I'm just going to throw to you for a question in relate, relating to that in a way around the role of the DPO in the advocacy. And that really came through when you were speaking about how important it is that we've got those well-established DPO networks at country, regional level, that you're working together as networks in order to be able to facilitate an effective disability inclusive response to COVID-19, then, then perhaps we've seen before that to, from me looking on at the way the DPO networks have been interacting and working, it seemed very fast and very strong. And, and that seems to be something that has um, been able to benefit from all of the work that's gone on in the last decade and more in really building those networks. So you're at a state of readiness, perhaps that we've not seen before. Um, yeah. And is that an opportunity to further highlight the benefit of investment in ensuring that these networks are sustained, that they are resourced as said has spoken about and also Mika um, and further enabled so that we can respond when these things happen. Yes, definitely to all um, that. I, I think um, certainly, for, uh, firstly, with um, my organisation and myself, have been involved with um, our DPO networks such as the PDF for quite some time. And we've always considered that a, a highly valuable opportunity to work together to support the work that we do. So we've always recognised that and we've certainly drawn on it heavily during these times. Uh, it, it's, um, for example, um, prior to COVID when Australia went through the bushfire season, I was over in Suva for a PDF board meeting and took the opportunity to meet with their Peru unit, which does work in this area. And because we hadn't really had the opportunity at domestic level in Australia to uh, for DPOs to be engaged with um, disaster risk planning response efforts. Um, that conversation I had with PDF um, staff was around what what's their experience in, in, in country around the Pacific in really working with grassroots DPOs that are, may not have the resourcing to respond to this work. You know, what are the different ways of um, that we could be looking at responding? And, um, you know, one of the lessons we learned from that discussion, there was quite, it was a very, it was a fabulous uh, discussion, very helpful, was around the whole need to actually look at what the current picture is and to work out who the key players are, or the, who the key responders are, who are the key decision makers, and what's the opportunities for us to link in with them. And initially, we, in, in Australia, we had to rely very heavily, um, not only on our, our, our own networks here in country, but also with our regional networks like the PDF. Also just um, dialing into web webinars, the various webinars that have been going on, some of which are organized through the UN, some through organizations like ACFID, others through uh, DPO networks like International Disability Alliance, just sharing information, um, getting an idea of what's happening across the globe, globally, what are uh, some good practices, what are very um, distressing, concerning things that we're seeing. So it's not, it's, it was sharing information, sharing good practices, um, just supporting each other's work and that reinforcement that what you were doing was of, of, of was, was useful. <laughs> and and um, yeah, so certainly we've drawn on those networks very heavily. And within our country and within Australia, we also initially, we had to advocate and we still do um, collectively, we had to pull together to collectively advocate um, to get a seat at the table to actually make sure that people with disability and their representative organisations were involved with the, the response efforts. Um, and so that's definitely, we've, it's, um, whilst we've always recognised the value of those networks, it's become very clear to us and our government, I believe in terms of how we can work together to strengthen that disaster response effort. In terms of opportunity, uh, we would certainly hope that this has shown um, 
others that, that DPOs have a role, to, people with disability have a direct role to play. Um, anything from what's happening on the ground, you know, how we're um, identifying where services gaps, service gaps are, identifying vulnerable communities, uh, identifying violence, abuse and neglect and exploitation and raising concern about that. So giving a voice to people particularly marginalised um, and how valuable that can be to government and other key stakeholders in responding to the disaster. So we're very hopeful that that will be valued, our role that we've played um, and including within the health system, the health system's response to COVID, that um, we do have a role to play. We have um, advice that we can provide. We have independent advice that we can provide. Um, but also, as has been mentioned by all of the speakers, the issue of resourcing. So we, whilst we want to be seen as an essential service, we think we feel we need to be seen as an essential service and that outreach has taken on um, a very important role, much more important role than it probably has ever been recognised for um, in terms of not just providing advocacy, but actually outreach into very difficult to reach communities and isolated communities and people. Um, but also, so the need to recognise us as essential services as the importance that outreach has to play. Um, but also the, the resourcing of that, that um, we can't, it, it is very difficult to continue that work whilst continuing or taking on that work whilst continuing to provide the other, all the other work that we do. And, you know, we're, we're facing, uh, my own organisation is actually facing a quarter of our staff being cut, um, that section of our organisation that does outreach because it's funded through a different source. <laughs> so it's that, um, the need to also uh, see that when it comes to emergency situations like this, we need to just look at what is actually essential and, and what's needed, particularly in terms of dealing with mental health um, consequences of this situation. Great. Okay, thank you. That was a really comprehensive answer. And, and I think sort of one of the things that I draw out of that is just the importance of highlighting and having um, individual stories of how the DPO network and across the region here in Australia and across the region has actually made a difference to the lives of people and, and gathering those stories so that we can continue to highlight how important it is that we have strong representative bodies available as a technical resource and, and an on the grounds resource for all of us when we're trying to respond in a disability inclusive way without your networks we really can't do it. And so being able to really highlight what you've achieved and why you've been able to achieve it is important for us all, um, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I'd like to thank um, Seta, Sam and Mika um, for, for the time that you spent in pulling together your thoughts um, for the panel and, and for your presentations and being with us now. Um, I can see there's a lot of questions that are coming up, but before we go on to the Q&A, what I would really like to do first is introduce um, Alex Devine and Whitney Yip, um, who are going to launch the guidance report on making research inclusive of people with disabilities. And you know, it is really timely that you're launching that at this time, when I'm sure there's a lot of research going on around COVID and responses. Um, so this was a collaborative project between the Research for Development Impact Network, so that's the RDI network, and the CBN NOSL partnership. Um, Alex, um, who will be speaking in a moment, joined the Nossel Institute in 2005 via the Victorian Public Health Training Scheme. And she worked in the mental health and HIV areas, but for the past eight years, her local and international research capacity development and technical assistance expertise has focused on disability inclusive development. Um, she was recently the lead researcher on a UNICEF funded situational analysis of children with disability in Cambodia and in addition was the co-investigator of an Australian government funded study to develop the rapid assessment of disability, the RAD, um, a toolkit which measures the effectiveness of development activities that target or include people with disabilities. And with her, we have Whitney, who is the RDI Network Communications Coordinator um, and is involved in translating research for policymakers and the wider public. So I shall hand it over to both of you to give us some information about the guidance report. 
Thank you so much, Kylie. And, and firstly, thank you so much to the panel for your knowledge and, and insight today, and also for sharing the platform to enable us to launch these very hot off the press research for all guidelines, um, which have been collated, as Kylie said, through partnerships between the RDI network and also Pacific Disability Forum, CBM NOSL and our steering committee with the support of DFAT as well. So I guess while this webinar has really focused on COVID and, and the need for disability inclusive development, it's also really demonstrated the critical role of those enduring and resource partnerships between development programmers, uh, people with disabilities and their representative DPOs in being able to respond to unexpected pandemics and other crises in a way that ensures people with disabilities are included in the response. So these research for all, making research inclusive of people with disabilities guidelines have really also been informed by such partnerships um, between researchers with and without disabilities, um, with development programmers and DPOs and the increasing implementation of disability inclusive development research that so many people I know present in the webinar today have been involved in over the last two decades or so, much again of which has been funded by DFAT. And I guess it's not only that research has informed the guidelines, but it's been really important to that continually informing our understanding of how we can ensure people with disabilities are included in both the processes and outcomes of development programming. Um, but, but as Sam and Seta and Mika have, have clearly highlighted today, there's just that greater and ongoing engagement is always needed. So we really encourage everyone to, um, to see how they might draw on these guidelines to strengthen inclusion within our research and evaluation work and how that can inform subsequent development and humanitarian programming. Over to you, Whitney. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everybody. I'm Whitney. Um, so we've really designed this um, guide to be as easy to understand and workable for busy practitioners. You know, not everybody always has time. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we would, but we hope that we can still be inclusive, even though not everybody might know what to do. So we've designed this guide for everyday practitioners and we've divided into three sections. Um, the first section really covers the background um, and assumptions on disability inclusive development. Uh, the second section devotes itself to ethical considerations and um, I guess tools and resources on how you might tweak your research process just a little bit to make it inclusive. So it doesn't actually need to be anything big or difficult. It just is a small tweak. And the third section is focused on the research cycle. So that's from planning, designing, implementation and the dissemination of um, this work. So like someone I think asked, um, how do we get more strength-based and incorporate people with disabilities uh, information back into um, policy. So being able to disseminate that information um, in a way that DPOs can actually utilize um, and access um, is really important. And so we're hoping that this guide will absolutely help everyone to be able to do that. Um, and in fact, we are also going to um, work with, Ac we're gonna be co-hosting with ACFID um, a webinar series. Um, we're gonna host uh, three webinars on Thursday, 2nd of July, Thursday, 23rd of July, and Thursday, 13th of August. <laughs> Um, to do a bit of a deep dive into the guide and it is now available and I will pop the link into uh, the chat um, to everybody. I've just popped the link in the chat and that is the link to go and download the guide as well as watch our little animation about the guide. Um, and it is, there is, it is a PDF upload, um, but it has been designed to be an accessible PDF. So it will be, it is able to be read by most um, screen readers and it is interactive. So you can click in and out and it will 
um, go, you know, if it, if it says click, go to page 20 and you click go to page 20, it will jump to page 20 for you. So you don't need to be scrolling up and down all the time. And I think that is about it from me. So please go ahead and have a look at our um, document. Thank you so much for attending and watching the little launch and thank you to everybody for um, sharing their time with us. Uh, back to you, Kylie. Great. Thank you very much, both Alex and Whitney. And it is really great to know that those webinars are coming. So if you want to know more and, you know, from, from the perspective of um, my organisation, uh, when you are doing research that involves anything to do with the lives of people with disabilities, doing that in a disability inclusive way cannot be more rewarding. Um, so I strongly encourage organisations to think really hard about how they make their research evaluation, monitoring, all of it truly disability inclusive. Um, now, we have the bit that I always struggle with the most, which is the Q&A. We have a bunch of questions that are up and um, I've noted that there are a couple that are really trying to tease out a little bit around social protections and um, social vulnerability. And so I'm gonna try and weave them together a little bit. So we do have a specific question which um, is addressed to you, Setter, but I don't feel like you have to be entirely on the spot with this, um, which is in relation to what the social security um, systems are in Fiji and the context in particular during COVID-19. But then there's a more general one about how social protection schemes are operating in the Pacific um, and how they can ensure economic participation of people with disabilities not reinforcing stigma and practices that keep disabilities at home, which also blends with an earlier question I saw that came up around ensuring that people with disabilities do not become passive resistance of aid packages, um, you know, kits, whatever, that they, they are actively involved. And so sort of wells into that is what are the social protection schemes and how are they operating? So I'm going to throw that to the panel to see who would like to respond and you can all chip in a little bit if you would like. I see Seti you have your mute off so perhaps if you'd like to go first. I, I, I'll take the, 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 the question. Yeah for, for um, social protection uh, is something uh, for person disabilities that is yeah, for, for the perceived Yes, so uh, yeah, what are the social protection um, schemes in Fiji and, and how have they been impacted? You know, how do you yeah, for, use social yeah, protection during yeah. COVID-19? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, there, there is, uh, of course, disability allowance and um, uh, that's not affected uh, during COVID, but those persons with disabilities who were not receiving it and have applied uh, to, to, to receive it during the COVID, those applications are still sitting there uh, waiting to be processed. Um, and then I uh, did also mention the um, bus fare subsidy, uh, $40 a month, uh, that was slashed to $20. This is to persons with disabilities. Uh, I, I also, that's for Fiji. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the social, uh, what we call the National the Provident Fund. Uh, Social Security for those who are working, a person with disabilities who are working and have been laid off, I can access that. But those who, are, who have not worked and do not, have not contributed, do not have contribution in, in that fund, I cannot access it because they don't have any there. But the governments, governments, uh, the Fiji government at least, uh, are topping up those workers who whose contribution are not um, are not sufficient, All right? So my argument is that if they are doing are topping up for those who do not have sufficient contribution in the fund, why not extending that to those that actually do not have anything in the fund? Mm. So so and and that can come in the form of topping that up to through their disability pension, if you like, that Tonga did. Fiji did not. And I think that the, 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 the so, so, so those 
Uh, this is an experience for Fiji. Uh, in, in, because there were COVID cases here, and Tonga went ahead, even though they didn't have any COVID uh, a case, they still top up the, 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 the social uh, protection uh, disability pension, if you like, to person disabilities in Tonga. Uh, the, um, the question I asked earlier about hardships faced by families, including persons with disabilities um, at, at this time. So that would be my response to that question. Okay. Maybe Mika or Sam might want to add. Thank you, Sam. Sam? Um, just to add, I think we recently did a survey and there's, um, that PWD recently did a survey specifically around, well, particularly looking at um, the economic social protections for people with disability um, and COVID. And what we found, um, I can share that link to that uh, later on. Um, I haven't got it in front of me to do so now, um, but it's available on our website. But that it was, um, you know, there's, there's in, quite increased costs for people with disability, just in terms of, um, cost of food items, cost of medical items, prices have gone up or are, hard, are difficult to access those things. So just the um, reliance that people have on service providers or third party family, mem or family members to resource, access things that they need. So I think that, um, you know, there's just, it, it's not just about the social protection that people might receive during non-COVID times, but when we have an emergency situation like this, how cost of living have significantly increased for people with disability. And the, also the difficulty in accessing things without paying additional um, cost for that. Uh, also, yeah, so th I, th I think that was just a general comment I thought I'd make, and I'll forward the link to that, that survey that we're, the, um, the findings from that survey through after this. Great, thank you, Sam. And and Mika, did you have something to add to the issue of or yeah, the question around what kind of social protection schemes there are in the Pacific and how can they be used or strengthened in order to prevent that um, the economic hardships that people with disabilities are facing and also that um, tendency towards them being passive recipients of others in their communities who are able to access financial supports. You know, Seta talked about people who are employed um, being able to access supports in Fiji, but we know that the, you know, there's, there's only a small percentage of people with disabilities who have employment in countries across the Pacific and in Australia indeed. Um, so thanks, uh, Kylie. I think uh, the point I'd make is one approach which we've seen as being quite successful in the Pacific is around the skills development programs. So if we can ensure that skills development programs that are rolled out in Pacific Island countries are inclusive of people with disabilities, we are actually helping to um, enable people with disabilities to um, be meaningfully employed, to contribute to their communities and to um, for all of us to get away from that charity-based model that none of us uh, are particularly fond of. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mika. Um, so I, I have another question, which again, sort of going into that sort of structural and social factors a little bit. Um, so Scott Avery has asked, what needs to be done to capture what has been learned from this pandemic management on the structural and social factors that have caused people with disability to be more vulnerable to COVID-19. Um, so that could be incorporated into longer term planning for disability inclusion. So I guess, you know, this is where we are now. What could we be doing to prevent being at that baseline in the future? <laughs> so I'm not taking your mute, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, big question, Scott. Uh, look, I again, I'm really, I've got my DPO hat on here, um, what we've learnt from it, which we're hearing is, um, a glo we're, we're hearing this globally from disabled people's organisations and advocacy organisations, is that we, we may have um, fancy regional plans in place and to either implement a convention or to have disaster risk management. We may even have, as Australia does, a fantastic national 
plan in place for disaster risk um, response, uh, planning and response rather, and um, that that can. And now we've we've got a quite a what I understand to be quite a good national COVID disability COVID response plan for people with disability. So apparently. Um, that is actually internationally considered quite a, a good plan. Um, that is a start, but unless we actually significantly increase engagement with people with disability and their representative organisations in planning how we're going to respond to a, an emergency. Now, we couldn't have foreseen the likes of a, this type of pandemic. No, no one expected it, I don't believe. Um, and things have emerged very rapidly. Uh, but we could have been better prepared. And, you know, that is even from a country that is a uh, high income country. So even though um, if, we, if we don't have it embedded in our, not only our plans, but our practices around dealing with planning for response, sorry, emergencies and responding to them, if we don't have it um, embedded in those plans and guidelines that people with disability DPOs must be involved all actively involved all along the way then it's 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 a little bit too late to worry or think about doing that once an emergency hits and we have had two major emergencies in this country so i you know it's i think one thing we've really learned is how valuable that engagement with dpos can be what value we can add to the planning and and now response to emergency um, and that we need to be seen as an essential service. So that might seem very simplistic, but very strong message I'm hearing when you know you dial into these webinars and whatever from people with disability is that advocacy and DPOs need to be seen as essential to planning and response. That we the importance of outreach, and that we need to be resourced in a different way to do that. So it may not fit within our ongoing resourcing um, capacity. If it doesn't, if we can't do this work, then we need to be resourced to respond to it effectively. So that would be the key things that stick out for, for me, for our okay. DPOs. Thanks, Sam. And, and I wonder if, um, Nika or Seta, if you want to just sort of dig a bit more into um, what's behind this question, which is really, I think, asking about those factors that are the ones that put people with disability at a more vulnerable position when we come to something like a pandemic. So the, you know, the economic issues, you know, we know that people with disabilities are amongst the poorest of the population very often, that they don't, they're not often employed, employed, that we do have really weak social protection systems in many of the countries that we're talking about. So the, you know, a lot of people maybe aren't even registered or previously identified as having a disability. So when this comes, and a social, system, uh, social protection economic top up, for example, gets there, people aren't even registered in the first instance. So I think this question is really trying to get at well, what is going on in our communities if we're not prepared? You know, what can we do better? Uh, okay, sorry, <laughs> I was trying to. Okay, and I, no, I think uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent question again. Um, I think to me, it's the, 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 this word disability inclusion matters. I, th I think we, we cannot continue to, to, to treat and, and, and see disability inclusive development as just a buzzword, as something to be done tokenistically. COVID 19, this pandemic you know, brought to bear the, the, probably the, the lack of disability inclusion. Uh, because it was unexpected, uh, it, uh, it had to be done and done quickly uh, and at the cost of leaving the furthest behind. So for me, it, it then we talk about accessibility standards. Um, things that, that the countries need to have in place now, into place now. Consulti consultation with, with persons with disabilities or uh, women's groups or youth groups, whatever the, 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 the target uh, group is, having a conversation with them and have these uh, uh, plans that, that can, this, uh, know that can, is, is ready to be rolled out when they're called upon. So, so I think what then happens when 
messages were, be, were coming out during the pandemic, they were not accessible. They were not accessible to persons who are deaf, to those who are blind. The, the push for physical distancing, social distancing, doesn't apply to everybody, though it was forced to be for everybody. So I think we need to do a better job thinking, planning, documenting, resourcing on what inclusion for persons with disabilities is in any given setting, rather than be caught by, 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 by surprise uh, when, when crisis happens. So I think we really need to shift. Um, um, uh, Sam talked about that being part of the, 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 the system. We need, we need to ensure that it is part of the game, part of the game and not something that is just being thought of uh, or need to address uh, during crisis. So I think that to me is a big structural change, an attitudinal change. Funders like DFAT are calling for it. Now, are our countries being honest enough? Uh, are they receptive enough to look at their systems, look at their policies, identify the gaps and, and patch them up around inclusion of persons disabilities? I think to me, that's, that to me are the big change that need to happen, at least what's in the Pacific, to, to make sure that what happens with the con, uh, pandemic and the effect of persons with disabilities are not uh, repeated. Thank you, Kylie. Okay, thank you very much, Seda. And Mika, I'm, I'm gonna give you the last word on this question, and I think that will be the last question and I, I apologize to those of you that have put questions there that we haven't had a chance to respond to this always happens it's not that they weren't important um, I was just trying to pull through those that would really draw out from our speakers um, but Mika is there something you would like to add to that issue of really kind of readiness um, around and what we can do to um, reduce the vulnerability of people with disabilities even though I actually think that word vulnerable is something we need to be careful with but over to you Mika. Thanks, Kylie. I mean, this is a really interesting issue and you can uh, tackle it from all sorts of different directions. I mean, we know for a start that people with disabilities are disproportionately affected by the socio and economic factors around COVID-19. They're at higher risk of contracting COVID-19. And this is partly due to the barriers that may limit or prevent them from accessing public health and hygiene information, uh, adequate resources to implement good hygiene, a reliance on physical contact with the environment and a need for contact with support persons, all of which challenge uh, the call for social distancing. Um, many people with disabilities are also at elevated risk of serious illness and death if infected by COVID-19 due to pre-existing health conditions and other risk factors. Um, an additional challenge for people with disabilities is the disruption of an access to the health services that they routinely rely on. Now, how to actually uh, address these? Um, you know, there's a whole range of factors that uh, uh, need to be considered. But one of the things that struck me in particular in the very early stages of the pandemic was the lack of access to, ex lack of accessible communication, including sign language, in, uh, in sharing advice to people on what the pandemic was and how to actually respond to it. Uh, there was also real problems in lack of access to services and programs, including health centres and food and other essential distribution centres or programs. Um, we also uh, saw uh, some real problems uh, that were clear violations of human rights in some countries where medical triage uh, uh, principles that were put in place were actually discriminating against and violating the rights of people with disabilities because they were being put last in, in the treatment and the response. How to actually respond to this in the longer term, and how to tackle the structural and societal factors. One key element, uh, and this is echoing uh, Sam's comments and also Setter's comments, is ensuring that people with disabilities have voice so that they have the opportunity to meaningfully 
engage in the design, the implementation and the monitoring of programs that are intended to uh, benefit the community so that those programs benefit all members of the community, not those who are able-bodied. And so recognising that, um, we need to, um, Sam uses the expression of recognising that BPOs are essential services. We definitely need to continue to support the capacity building of disabled people's organisations so that they can effectively engage in the policy dialogue that will frame what the future response to a pandemic or any other crisis is. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mika. And I think that that is a fantastic closing statement from the speakers and our panel. And I would really like to thank you all for, um, for joining us today. And I'm now gonna do a, a very quick uh, wrap up, which is really just a whole series of thank yous. Um, so on behalf of the ADDC, I'd like to thank ACFID um, for their partnership in hosting the webinar. And also, I'd like to highlight ACFID's continued support of disability inclusive practice as a founding principle, which is embedded within the ACFID code of conduct. And we always get such great support from ACFID and ACFID members on this issue. So thank you very much for that. Um, thank you also to our speakers, Seta, Samantha and Nika for your insights and for your on the ground experience and also to Alex and Whitney for sharing the guidance report on making research inclusive. And don't forget if you're really interested and I hope you are to join at least one of the webinars that Whitney shared. Um, thank you also to the behind the scenes work of our ADDC executive, executive officer, Lucy Daniel, um, who put a lot of time and thought into the content for this panel and for the webinar. So thank you very much to that. And also to Vicky Wong from ACFID um, on all things related to making a webinar actually work. And I greatly appreciate your technical confidence in um, putting the whole thing together. So thank you very much for that. Last by no, but by no means least, thank you to all of the participants um, for your focus and attention on the issue for the work that you're doing in your own organisations to strengthen a strong, practical, rights-based and inclusive approach to Australia's international development activities and also for your questions today. And I am sorry that we weren't able to answer all of them. However, you can, of course, join the ADDC and join the, um, the forum, which name I can't remember, the network. Um, that we have and and that's a really great opportunity to explore options and opportunities for your disability inclusive practice and you can also contact the speakers um, directly and finally um, I'd just like to remind you that when the webinar closes you will be directed to an exit survey and we highly value your feedback and we warmly encourage you to take a few moments to respond to the survey and I think you would all appreciate it is through feedback that we can hope to spiral upwards to strengthen and improve our work. And so we really do look forward to hearing you from you through the survey. Um, and with that, I think we are going to close dead on time and I'd like to thank everyone once again. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. <laughs>